Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our 2021 Fall Virtual Viscosity Summit. We are excited to have you all here. And before we get started with our first presenter, we do just want to give everyone a few reminders and run quickly through our agenda. At 10 a.m. right now, we will have our first presenter from Reform Biologics. At 11, we will have our next presenter from Virginia Tech. We'll do a one hour lunch break from noon until 1 p.m. Pacific. And then at 1 p.m., we'll resume with presenters from the Blink Group presenting with the CEO of VIA Innovations. And we'll conclude the day with a presenter from the very own RioSense. If anyone would like to follow us, we do encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. And before we introduce our first speaker, just a reminder, please ask your questions in the chat pane as our speakers do their presentations, because all of our speakers have left a lot of time at the end of their presentation for a Q&A session to get to everyone's questions. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Phil Wietrich. He's a, a senior research scientist at Reform Biologics in Woburn, Massachusetts, holding a Bachelor of Science degree in chemical engineering from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. He has 11 years of experience in technology development with the last seven years at Reform Biologics, developing new formulation strategies for biotherapeutics. Today, Phil will be presenting predicting injection force for high concentration monoclonal antibody formulations using high shear rheology measurements. Without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Phil Wietrich. Thank you, Eden. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Great. Thank you uh, so much for the introduction. And thank you for having me uh, here today to present at the Viscosity Summit. And thank you, everyone, for attending my virtual presentation today. As Eden mentioned, I'll be talking about predicting injection for injection forces for high concentration monoclonal antibody formulations using high shear rheology measurements. Briefly, uh, as we get started, for those of you who are not actively engaged in the biopharma industry, I want to begin by answering the question, why am I talking about monoclonal antibody or MAB formulations? The chart shown here from a 2020 publication visualizes the rapid evolution and expansion of antibody therapies over the last 45 years, with the market size growing at nearly an exponential rate over the last uh, several years. By one count, there are now 108 FDA-approved MAB-based drugs, with hundreds more currently in clinical development. One of the prominent advantages that has contributed to the rise of MAB therapies is their specificity. MABs can be engineered to bind to specific targets in treating disease, and this ability has been leveraged extensively for oncology and inflammatory disease, among other areas. Currently, the majority of MAB-based drugs are administered intravenously. At Reform Biologics, one of our main areas of focus is working to convert IV-dosed antibody drugs to subcutaneous administration by reformulating existing drug products. The effort to move from intravenous to subcutaneous dosing flows directly out of our mission as a company to enhance patients' lives with a special emphasis on fragile patients, such as children and the elderly. However, subcutaneous administration of MAB-based drugs does not come without challenges. The large doses of MAB therapies, hundreds of milligrams needed for efficacy, coupled with the small volume limitation, less than two milliliters for subcutaneous administration, requires formulating MABs at very high concentrations, 
often well above 100 mg per mil. And because MAVs are large complex macromolecules, formulating at high concentration can result in both stability and viscosity issues due to the close proximity of the molecules in solution. You can see here the, the size of the MAB is nearly equivalent to the center to center distance between MABs in solution at high concentration, meaning the distance between adjacent protein surfaces is estimated to be two nanometers or less. At high concentration, MAB formulations exhibit elevated solution viscosities, primarily due to attractive interactions between the antibodies. The correlation between increased formulation viscosity and attractive protein-protein interactions has been well documented in literature. On this slide is a summary of the findings from a 2012 publication where the authors compared concentration-dependent viscosity curves, shown on the left, for a number of different antibodies with the diffusion interaction parameter for the same formulations, which is shown in the plot on the right. So the diffusion interaction parameter is determined from dynamic light scattering experiments, and it's an indicator of the net interactions between solutes. Here we see that there's a strong correlation between the tendency of a MAB formulation to build viscosity at high concentration with an increase in attractive protein-protein interactions indicated by a more negative diffusion interaction parameter. And with that background, we now get to the crux of my presentation today, and that is the relationship between MAB formulation viscosity and the force required to administer a drug via subcutaneous injection. From Poise's equation adapted for flow in a syringe, which is shown here in the top left of the slide, we can see that the force required for injection is directly proportional to the viscosity of the formulation and inversely proportional to the size of the needle. And then you also have the flow rate, the length of the needle, and the radius of the syringe uh, involved in the equation as well. Uh, here we have on this slide some measured syringe glide force data for formulations at different viscosities. You can see that the, the measured force increases as viscosity increases. Most of us don't often think in terms of Newtons, uh, so I've provided some points of reference on the right vertical axis of the plot. You can see that for approximately six Newtons of force, that's roughly the weight of a basketball, if you imagine uh, having to place an object on the syringe plunger to inject the uh, formulation, you would need a, a, about the weight of a basketball for approximately six, six newtons of injection force. When you get to 30 newtons, it's about equivalent to the weight of a single brick. At 44 newtons, you're talking roughly uh, a 10 pound dumbbell. And then up at 74 newtons, we're talking about the weight equivalent to approximately two gallons of water. When thinking about high concentration MAB formulations for subcutaneous injection, what we are most concerned with is the force required for injection. Syringe glide force measurements are too material and labor intensive to be used for screening formulations. So the question for us today is, can we predict injection forces from viscosity data? Here on slide eight, we have uh, an overview of the study that was designed to compare syringe glide force measurements with viscosity measurements for five different MAB formulations. The syringe glide force measurements were performed with an Instron tensile tester equipped with a 100 Newton load cell. The compression, and, uh, and we we're using a, a 1 mil BD syringe with a 30 gauge needle. The compression rate was set at 342 millimeters per minute, uh, and that's equivalent to approximately 1 mil per 10 second 
uh, injection rate for our system. The system was set up so that the sample fluid was ejected into an open container and the temperature was uncontrolled. It was uh, just the ambient temperature in our laboratory. For the viscosity measurements, uh, we used a Rayosense Initium automatic viscometer uh, with one of four different channels. And we performed shear rate sweeps uh, with approximately 20 data points per sweep where we looked at viscosity at a shear rate of, of about 100 reciprocal seconds up to the maximum attainable, attainable shear rate uh, for the instrument for that formulation. And then in the case of viscosity data where there was shear thinning observed, we applied the uh, WRM uh, correction to the, the shear rate and viscosity data. And all the viscosity measurements were performed at 25 degrees. And there were, we, we used three biosimilar monoclonal antibodies for this study um, that are, are biosimilar versions of you know, commercially available uh, monoclonal antibody drug products. And you can see uh, those five uh, formulations shown in the table at the bottom of the slide. Uh, MAB1 are the A formulations, MAB2, the B formulations, and MAB3, the C formulations. And in the case of MAB2 and MAB3, uh, we included a second formulation with a viscosity reducing excipient. And so the formulations with viscosity reducing excipients are, are noted by the number one, and the formulations without viscosity reducing excipients are noted by the number zero in the formulation ID. Here is a picture of the Instron test setup at Reform. So you have the load cell that's on an assembly that can be uh, moved up and down at a controlled speed. And then there's a, a platform that is attached to the load cell and that uh, platform will depress the syringe plunger during an experimental run. And then you can see the, the syringe is, is held in place here uh, on this platform below. On the right of the slide is a diagram of the microfluidic chip at the heart of the Rayosense Initium viscometer. Uh, the sample fluid uh, flows through the channel and the pressure drop across the channel is measured from which the sample viscosity is derived. Different uh, shear rates, <clears throat> excuse me, Different shear rates and viscosity ranges can be explored by changing the flow rate, channel dimensions, and dynamic range of the pressure transducers. As I alluded to on a previous slide, concentrated MAB formulations can exhibit non-Newtonian fluid behavior in the form of shear thinning, meaning that the viscosity decreases at higher shear rates. Now, the viscosity builds in concentrated antibody formulations due to network formation resulting from attractive protein-protein interactions. But these networks can be overcome by high shear rates, such as the high shear rates experienced by the formulation in the needle during injection, resulting in an observed shear thinning fluid behavior. In the plot on the top right, we have anticipated shear rates as a function of the inner diameter of the needle for needle sizes from 27 gauge down to 30 gauge. And what you see is that the anticipated shear rates for fluids uh, or for formulations being administered at, at flow rates that are typical for subcutaneous administration, those shear rates are all on the order of 100,000 or several seconds. So the anticipated in-needle shear rates are going to be much larger than the shear rates that are typically used in measuring the viscosity of antibody formulations. Therefore, the fluid behavior of the antibody formulation must be extrapolated to predict the viscosity and subsequent injection forces that will be experienced. <clears throat> 
And as I had mentioned, one of the main goals of this study was to demonstrate the robustness of being able to predict injection forces for a series of different MAB formulations by comparing force values predicted from viscosity measurements with the actual measured syringe glide force values from the Instrom measurements. So now I will move into presenting the data and findings from our study. Here we have a summary of the syringe glide force data measured for the different formulations using the Instrom test setup at Reform. The figure on the right shows, or the figure on the left, excuse me, shows the raw data collected from the Instrom measurements. And so you can see that the measured force is plotted as a function of the displacement distance. The force initially increases with increasing displacement and then reaches a plateau value. And the data at the, once the measurement reached the plateau was averaged and that average uh, was reported as the syringe glide force for the measurement. And for each formulation, there were three uh, runs completed on the Instron uh, and, and we observed high reproducibility in the measured uh, glide force value. The figure on the right of the slide shows the measured syringe glide force as a function of antibody concentration for the five formulations that were studied. What we observe is that the injection force for the, the formulations is both antibody dependent and formulation dependent. As we see that for the cases of MAB2 and MAB3, which are the B formulation and the C formulations, that the formulation without viscous reducing excipients had a higher measured syringe glide force than the formulations containing the viscosity using excipients. If you compare the gray curve to the light blue curve for MAB3 um, without excipient and with excipient, and then the darker blue plot and the green plot for MAB2. Finally, I'll note that we also measured the glide force for an empty syringe and use this value as the frictional force for the system when calculating glide forces from the viscosity data. So if you uh, remember from Boise's law, there's, there's both the force uh, due to the viscosity of the sample, and then there's a, a force related to uh, a, the frictional force that's added to that uh, that results in the syringe glide force. All right, jumped ahead there, I apologize. So uh, here on slide 12, we have the viscosity results uh, for each formulation and, mob, and MAB concentration plotted as a function of the shear rate. Note that the y-axis for each of these plots, the, the range for the y-axis is different. And, and that's because each of the three MABs that were studied here exhibited a different tendency to build viscosity with increasing protein concentration. MAB1, which is the A formulation, or the A0 formulation here, uh, showed the, the lowest viscosity, so uh, the viscosity build was the least as antibody concentration was increased, um, followed by MAB2, which, are, which is used in the B formulations. Um, MAB2 had uh, slightly higher viscosity values than MAB1. And then MAB3 had uh, much higher viscosity values than MAB1 or MAB2. And at the higher viscosities, we were limited in regards to the maximum shear rate at which we could measure the viscosity. So you'll notice that in some of the plots, we're able to measure viscosities out to 100,000 reciprocal seconds. Um, and that uh, in other cases uh, were limited and, and we're not able to get quite as high in the shear rate. And that's the case for the two high, highest concentration formulations for the C0 formulation. And in this case, uh, we weren't able to uh, get to a shear rate high enough to observe uh, shear thinning behavior. 
but in all the other cases, uh, we were able to observe, observe some shear thinning behavior uh, for the different formulations. The viscosity data for each formulation had two regions, which is easier to see in the plot here, uh, representative of the, the different viscosity data that was presented in the previous slide. So you have um, first the Newtonian response region or, or the region where the viscosity is independent of the shear rate. And then uh, followed by that, we have uh, a second region where we do see that the viscosity is decreasing as a function of increasing the shear rate. And this is a non-Newtonian or shear thinning response. And what we did to model this non-Newtonian behavior was take the data from uh, the shear rate sweep, sweep where we observed this shear thinning behavior and we fit that data with the power law model. And so here in the top right is the equation for the power law that uh, relates the viscosity as a function of the shear rate. And when you uh, plot the viscosity data as, uh, as, when you plot viscosity as a function of shear rate on a log log plot and fit that data to a linear model, uh, you can uh, acquire the uh, flow consistency index, the K, this K value from the y-intercept. And then the power law index uh, can be uh, calculated from the slope of that linear model. And for a Newtonian fluid, the, the power law index is a value of one, and it, at which point uh, this term would, would reduce to one and viscosity would be independent of shear rate. And for uh, fluids where we do observe shear thinning, uh, the the power law index value is less than one. And, and the more shear thinning the fluid is, uh, the lower the value of the power law index. Uh, and then, so for each of the formulations uh, and, and at each uh, MAB concentration, the power law uh, index and the power law parameters were uh, determined using this graphical analysis. And the power law index is plotted as a function of antibody concentration down in the bottom right of the slide uh, for each of the five antibody formulations. And what we observe is that uh, the power law index values for MAB1 and MAB2 are, are all above 0.9 meaning that these formulations have near Newtonian uh, behavior. Uh, in contrast, uh, MAB3, which is the C formulations, uh, we see that the power law index values are, are well below uh, a value of one, indicating more shear thinning behavior. And also for uh, these formulations, we observe that as antibody concentration was increased, the power law index decreased. Uh, which means that as as we have uh, higher concentrations of antibody, we're, we're seeing greater a greater extent of shear thinning, or that the shear thinning behavior becomes more pronounced as we uh, approach an antibody concentration of 200 mg per mole. And then in the case of the two formulation or the two antibodies where we have formulations with and without viscosity reducing excipient, uh, we observe that the power law index increased toward one in the presence of the viscosity reducing excipient. And so you can see this uh, is the case in for MAP2, uh, where the green data points represent the B1 formulation with the viscosity reducing excipient and the dark blue uh, MAP2 formulation, the dark blue data points are the MAP2 formulation without viscosity reducing excipient. And then also in the case of MAP3, we see that including the viscosity reducing excipient uh, increases the power law index, which means that the formulation is behaving more Newtonian-like and that those protein-protein uh, interactions that form networks are in solution that drive the viscosity build as you increase protein concentration are being mitigated 
uh, by the presence of the viscosity reducing excipient. So then the viscosity data generated was used to predict syringe glide force values for the formulations and compare it against the actual measured instron force values. And so first this was done using uh, the viscosity data from the Newtonian response. So if you remember, there are two uh, regions um, for the viscosity plot as a function of shear rate. Uh, the first region where the viscosity is independent of shear rate is what we're calling the, the Newtonian region or um, because the viscosity response uh, is, is not dependent on the, the shear rate. And so those viscosity values uh, were, were taken uh, and used to calculate the glide force um, for the formulation uh, using Posey's law and Posey's law. And, um, and also in addition to the antibody formulations, we included solutions of glycerol at different glycerol concentrations because uh, solutions of glycerol and water are known to be Newtonian fluids. And, and so uh, we can expect that the viscosity data for, a new, for the glycerol solutions um, should be able to be used to calculate uh, the syringe glide force um, accurately. And, and we do observe that if you see the orange data points for the uh, glycerol in water solutions fall right on the y equals x line in the plot of measured uh, glide force as a function of calculated glide force. And so uh, the glycerol results validate uh, the experimental setup. Um, however, for the MAB3 formulations especially, which are seen uh, at these data points that fall far below the y equals x line. The um, viscosity from that Newtonian region uh, resulted in a, a severely overestimated uh, glide force value compared to the actual measured glide force. So then we uh, used uh, two additional models um, to extrapolate the shear rate in the needle and subsequent formulation viscosity based on the power law model developed for each formulation. And then the calculated viscosity was used to predict the glide force uh, using Poisey's law. In the first of these models, the shear rate at the wall of the needle was estimated from the power law uh, index um, that was generated for the formulation. So you can see uh, in the equation here at the bottom of the graph, uh, this equation was used to calculate the shear rate at the wall in the needle and then using the, um, the power law model uh, established for that sample, the, the subsequent viscosity was calculated and then that viscosity was used uh, to determine, to predict the injection force. And so here you can see that when we're using the calculations based on the power law, uh, the, the data all trends with the y equals x line. We also looked at a, a second, um, slightly different uh, way of predicting injection force based on the power law index value. And uh, in this second case, uh, we were using an equation from a 2014 publication by Almendinger et al describing the effective shear rate in the needle uh, based on the power law index. So a slightly different shear rate was calculated and then used to uh, calculate the expected viscosity in the needle. And then that viscosity was again used to uh, calculate the syringe glide force uh, from the Poise law um, equation. And so in, in both cases, uh, we see that the, the power law models are, are able to allow for the accurate prediction of syringe glide force for antibody formulations where the shear thinning was most pronounced. And so that's in the C formulations, which are the gray and light blue data points. 
and also in the case of the B0 formulation, which was MAB2 without a viscous reducing excipient. So those were the three formulations where the power law index was the lowest, indicating the most shear thinning. And uh, in those three cases, uh, using either the, the wall shear rate model or, or using this effective shear rate uh, equation that was um, developed by Almendinger, uh, we're able to uh, get good agreement between the measured syringe glide force and the calculated syringe glide force. And that's depicted by those data points falling along the y equals x line. Um, however, we did notice that uh, both of these models seem to underestimate uh, the force required for the formulation that had the most Newtonian behavior, and that was the A0 uh, formulation, which was MAB1. And that's the yellow data points. You can see those uh, yellow data points fall above the y equals x line. Um, and, and we're not uh, as accurately predicted, the glide force was not as accurately predicted using the power law models uh, as it was if you look over at the, the plot on the far left where uh, those yellow data points do fall on the y equals x line. So I think at least two conclusions uh, can be drawn from this study. And, and the first is that high concentration MAP formulations exhibit a non-Newtonian behavior that's dependent on the identity of the antibody uh, and also dependent on the identity of the excipients in the formulation. And thirdly, it's also dependent on the concentration of the antibody in the formulation. As we saw that the power law uh, index uh, was concentration dependent and also uh, changed with with different antibody identities and, all, and with the inclusion of viscosity reducing excipient. Um, secondly, uh, despite the shear thinning behavior uh, that we observe in antibody formulations, uh, this study showed that glide force values can be accurately predicted for NAB formulations by characterizing the shear thinning behavior via viscosity measurements across a broad shear rate range. And then before I conclude uh, my talk today, I do want to make a few observations on some considerations for predicting injection force that came out of this study. Uh, the first is that accurately predicting injection forces will require accurate characterization of the syringe or device to be used with the formulation. In our case, we were using a, a model set up with a one mil BD syringe and a 30 gauge uh, BD needle. And during our method development, we observed that uh, there was quite a, a, a wide variation across a number of different needles tested uh, when we were measuring uh, glide force values of a glycerol solution. And when we observed this, we went back and, and looked at the technical data sheet for the, these particular uh, BD needles. And we found that the needle ID range uh, that was listed on the data sheet was um, from 0.14 millimeters to 0.18 millimeters. And so what, what's shown on the plot on the bottom right here on this slide are the calculated glide force values for a representative antibody formulation at, at three different uh, inner diameter, needle inner diameter values in, within that range. And you can see that uh, across that range of 0.14 millimeter to 0.18 millimeter, you can have a, a very uh, wide range of, of glide force values, especially as you get to higher antibody concentrations. Uh, the second consideration is that it's important to adequately characterize the shear thinning behavior of mm -hmm. antibody formulations when you're predicting injection force. And so what we observed in, in our study was that in some cases for very shear thinning formulations, uh, we needed to use a power law model to accurately predict uh, those injection forces. Um, but then in one case, uh, we saw that a formulation that had near Newtonian behavior may be more accurately predicted without power law considerations. Um, 
also, it's important to characterize shear thinning behavior because uh, that uh, characterization may have uh, some insight into the extent of protein-protein interactions in the formulation. And then it's also important to remember that the shear thinning behavior for MAB formulations will be concentration dependent. Uh, the third consideration is the impact of temperature on the fluid behavior of the formulation. And so we didn't look at that uh, particular variable in this study, but it's known that uh, the viscosity of these concentrated antibody formulations can vary uh, under different temperatures. So it would be important to um, deter to measure viscosity and bracket the temperature range for expected use of a drug product and then uh, generate an understanding of, of how much the syringe force might uh, fluctuate due to the uh, temperature. And then fourth and, and finally, uh, and this may be uh, obvious, but the force required to administer a drug to patient will be different than the glide force measured uh, injecting into air. With that, I would like to acknowledge a few of the people that made this presentation possible. From the management team here at Reform Biologics, I'd like to thank John Servillo and Bob Mahoney, who supported this study and provided helpful review of the presentation. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Tim Tran, one of my colleagues in the lab at Reform, who conducted all of the formulation, preparation, and instron measurements for this study. And then I'd also like to thank Stacy Elliott at Rayosense, who performed the viscosity measurements with the Initium uh, for the formulations in this study. And finally, I'd like to thank you for attending this virtual presentation. Thank you so much, Phil, for such a wonderful presentation. And we do have some questions that have come through and we'll hopefully be able to get to them all. Thank you for leaving time for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to just dive in and some of them are multi question, multi answer questions. Um, but this first one is just, can high shear in the needle damage the MAB structure? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, we haven't uh, studied that extensively, um, but we also haven't observed it. Uh, when we, you would expect that the, in one case, you know, da the damage that an antibody may experience through the needle would then uh, impact the measured force uh, of that formulation if you took that sample and then ran a, a glide force measurement again. Uh, and we didn't observe any changes to glide force even on samples that we've we've run through the needle several times. Um, but uh, we haven't done any further characterization on, on high concentration formulations that have been expelled through a syringe needle so we haven't done any chromatography or, or other, or performed other analysis to, to try and, and confirm that, that no damage is, is being done to the antibody you know, in that shear. It is a very short period of time, um, but, but I can't say conclusively one way or the other. And the next question, do you have a hypothesis um, as to why the different MABs behaved differently in their viscosity profiles? Well, I think it's, it's you know, in some cases, um, if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I showed a couple figures from a Connolly 2012 publication uh, where they looked at a number of different antibodies and they saw that certain antibodies build viscosity more than others, and they correlated that to protein-protein uh, interactions using dynamic light, light scattering measurements. And so the hypothesis would you know, generally be that the antibodies that show low viscosity have very little protein-protein interactions at play, whereas in, in our study, MAB3, uh, you know, because you see the high viscosity build and also because the uh, power law, the measured power law index value for you know, those MAP3 formulations was much below one, indicating a large amount of shear thinning behavior. That, that probably indicates that 
there were, there were more protein protein interactions at play and you had more of that network uh, formation in solution that drives your viscosity build. Thank you. Then uh, next question, what is the material cost to obtain shear thinning data at the very high shear rates? Does this need to be characterized for each separate formulation? So for example, do formulations with similar viscosity have similar power law indices? Yeah, that, so um, the first part of the question was about the, the cost to, to perform these viscosity measurements. And uh, in the case of you know the Rayosense Initium instrument, the volume of sample required is, is pretty low on the order of you know 70 to 90 microliters um, to to perform these shear rate sweeps. Uh, and so that's obviously a lot better than the you know, 600 microliters that we would need to perform, you know, the syringe glide force measurements. So you're almost reducing your uh, material consumption by a factor of 10 when you can predict the glide force from viscosity rather than, than actually having to measure it. So that, that'd be, you know, very advantageous when you're screening a number of different formulations. Um, the second part of the question, can you remind me, Eden? Yes, it was do does this need to be characterized for each separate formulation so the example oh yeah formulation right. so that, that's a really interesting question uh if you have formulations that have similar viscosity at uh, a lower shear rate you know would you expect them to have a similar power law index you know and in similar behavior as you go to higher shear rates so that's something that we haven't you know, fully explored i think when you're, you know, when you're at already at low viscosity, uh, you know, if you have a high concentration, low viscosity formulation, measuring at low shear rate, um, you know, you're probably going to be okay, and, and there's not going to be as as much difference. But it's sort of as you get into that range of asking the question, you know, exactly how low do we have to have the viscosity of this formulation be to to make it injectable? Um, you know, that's probably where characterizing it would be, you know, important. And I think, you know, because the material cost is so low to perform this analysis uh, and, you know, not just being able to predict injection force, but also being able to observe the, whether or not your formulation is, is behaving like a Newtonian fluid gives you an indication of are there still protein-protein interactions present that are driving the viscosity build or, or are we um, you know, near a Newtonian response. And, and that may, you know, have implications for determining what is the highest concentration that we can go. If we know that we're at a Newtonian response already, that means that there's probably not a lot of protein-protein interactions uh, contributing to our viscosity build. You know, I think those questions might get toward, you know, what is the maximum concentration that we can actually get to which I know is a, a question that comes up all the time in formulation development. And uh, do you think it's possible to estimate the power law index from measures of protein-protein interactions or cluster formation? Yeah, that's a good question. Also, I, I haven't explored that, so I really I can't say uh, you know, one way or the other. Um, I think if you're, you know, maybe if you're able to perform the, you know, light scattering measurements at, at higher concentrations, so you think of your G22 values, uh, it'd be interesting to try and correlate those and see if you could uh, predict the power law indices, but I just don't have any experience um, trying to do that. Um, and then someone asked, why did you perform the secondary model on the non-Newtonian behaving samples? Uh, the model from the 2014 paper, as well as the power law. Yeah, so that was really because uh, there was another publication that performed that comparison as well. And so um, we we wanted to explore that in our lab ourselves. Uh, so um, so that was the reason for, for looking at the two models. Um, 
you know, obviously Almond, the Almondinger uh, paper, that group uh, put forth the effective shear rate uh, model because they believe that it would be a, a more accurate representation of you know, what was happening across the whole um, fluid profile in the needle rather than just looking at the, the shear rate at the wall. And um, you know, another publication came out that uh, compared the two models and, and claimed that the, the shear rate at the wall was actually more accurate than the, uh, the effective shear rate model that the Almondinger uh, paper uh, put forward. So, so it was more just uh, out of curiosity to see if there were significant differences. And in most cases, I would say that we actually found the, the Almondinger model, the effective shear rate model to be slightly more accurate uh, when we compared the, the measured glide force values, um, but the, the differences were, were pretty small between between the two models. Wonderful. Um, and so this is a kind of a multi-part question. Uh, what do companies such as Reform do to account for various injection speeds by differing patients or caregivers? And are there studies that provide rough averages of how to quickly inject or if the rate is important, do you use an auto injection mechanism? Yeah, so a uh, great question, uh, a lot there. Um, I don't have a lot of you know, clinical experience. So uh, understanding how you know, a certain um, injection rate is, is selected, I, I can't speak to that. Uh, but I do think if you are able to characterize the shear thinning behavior of your formulation, you can use the equations to, to predict you know, how your injection force will change uh, with different flow rates. So at least um, you, know, you could be prepared and understand what your tolerance is and then, uh, and then go from there. And then in, in terms of device selection, you know, using an auto injector, uh, that's really not, not my area of of expertise, so so I, I don't have a lot of insight on the device side. And then we have just a few more, and we'll try to get through them all. Um, just so everyone knows, if there are any questions that come up or anything that we don't get to, uh, we do have all of the questions in our, our chat pane, and so we're happy to discuss offline as well, um, even internally. And so, Next question, Phil, is are the protein-protein interactions assumed transient self-associations? Are these more likely to be driven by electrostatic or hydrophobic patches? And have you considered the impact of aggregation on viscosity? Yep, so good question. Uh, I, would, I would say that um, the impact of aggregation on viscosity is, is definitely something to be considered. Hopefully you don't have uh, too much uh, aggregation or irreversible aggregation uh, in your formulation um, to begin with. Uh, and then, you know, I would assume that if you do have aggregated protein, then it's probably not going to, uh, you're not going to see those um, aggregate, aggregates break apart under shear if, if they're, you know, covalently bound in, in some way. Um, the uh, the protein protein interactions that you know form the the networks are are, are probably transient um, you know interactions. So that's you know the assumption is uh, in this study was that you know at high concentration your proteins are so close so you do have those. I think both electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions. Obviously. You know, in some cases, you know, certain antibodies, electrostatics dominate more than hydrophobic, uh, and it's also going to be dependent on your antibody concentration and the proximity, you know, between molecules. And uh, you know, Professor Tom Lowey has uh, written and presented on that those ideas uh, pretty extensively. Um, but but yeah, it, to answer your question, in, in this study, we're assuming those interactions are. Are, are transient and that they can be overcome by the shear rate just because now you're you know, you're getting past the time scale where those uh, those interactions occur. Mm 
And then uh, what effects do volume fraction and shear rate have on the relative viscosity of the tested material? Are there any standard correlations for these rheological properties? Eden, I'm going to need you to read that question again. Sorry. I'm sorry. What? No. What effects do volume fraction and shear rate have on the relative viscosity of the tested material? And are there any standard correlations for those rheological properties? Yeah. So I think uh, you know my answer to this question is not going to be very satisfying, uh, just because I you know I don't I don't know um, you know I think. The volume fraction piece is really interesting, especially when you think about uh, concentrated antibody formulations from a, a colloidal perspective. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, I, as as you're able to reduce the protein-protein interactions, the, you would expect that the the antibodies will behave more like uh, you know non-interacting colloids, and then and then the volume fraction you know, should be able to be used to um, predict the, uh, you know, the behavior of the fluid and, and the viscosity. Um, but I just haven't, haven't really studied that. Uh, so I, I can't speak to it more than, more than that. And then we'll go, uh, last question here. If you used power fit on a raw data set, was the power law index the same via the N negative one than your log log liner fit? They should be close, but K could be different. Yep, interesting question. Uh, we didn't do that. We just performed the graphical analysis uh, for the, the power law parameter and and the the power law index you know was used. To, to generate the, the shear rate in the needle. But, but yeah, if, you're, if your K value is off, that would obviously uh, impact your ability to calculate the viscosity at your extrapolated shear rate. Um, but but we, didn't, we didn't perform that comparison in this study. Wonderful. Well, again, if you have any questions after the summit, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at RioSense. We are happy to connect you with our presenters um, and to answer any questions we can as well. We want to thank you again, Phil, for such a wonderful presentation and for being part of our summit. Just a quick reminder before we take a five-minute break, we will send out recordings um, of the presentations after the summit concludes, so if anyone had any questions or anything they felt they missed, we will be sharing the content as well. And now we're going to take a short five minute break before we introduce our next presenter. And thank you again, Phil. All right, thank you, Eden.